I fear my paper will be too long, so just uh, there is a certain point where I can stop. Let's see where we go. So Vidyanandin was one of the most uh, industrious medieval Digambara authors on philosophical issues. Eight works of him have survived. A reported nine work uh, seems to be lost. A systematical study of his work will take more time, but one thing is safe to say. In Vidyanandin's thoughts, we can expect to find an attempt to refine the philosophical heritage of Jainism in a fierce scholastical context, contest with the other traditions of Indian thought. The starting point of my research has been the issue addressed by most of the speakers today, namely Anekantavada or Jain perspectivism. I am interested in the question how the claim that Jainism offers a model for reconciliating a multitude of perspectives is manifest in Vidyanandan's discursive practice. How does he deal with the numerous concepts of opposing philosophers? Are there, in fact, signs of a reconciliation? How does he handle the conflicts that undeniably exist between concepts pertaining to the core of the South Asian philosophical debate, that is, the conflict uh, conflicting propositions about the nature of liberation, the nature of the self, of substance, quality, and the relation of the means of knowledge and their object, etc. It turned out that Vidyanandin's discursive practice shows fewer traits of perspectivism than I initially hoped for. More precisely, the notion of tolerance that was attributed to Jainism, even in scholarly publications up to the 80s, plays no role in Vidyanandin's approach to the views of other intellectual tradition. He slashes opposing views as firstly as any of his colleagues from the Buddhist and Nyaya department. More surprisingly than the absence of intellectual ahimsa is the sparse application of the theories on viewpoints and uh, on modal predication in Vidyanandin's examination of non-giant -tradition, non traditions. I did not encounter a Saptabangi statement in his Satyashasana Pariksha, for instance, a work dedicated to the examination of tenets from non-giant traditions. The terms naya or durnaya are not even used there. From this, one could assume that this Jaina author got carried away in his argumentation against non jain views and that he neglected perspectivistic tendencies of Jain thought in favor of the emphasis of an uncompromising philosophical stance. I do indeed think that absolute postulates coming with that absolute postulates coming with such a stance are evident in Vidyanandan's work. However, I do not think that the theories of Nyayavada and Nyayavada and Syatvada are a mere goose to conceal these absolute postulates. I have previously argued that Vidyanandin was a way of dealing with non-Jain traditions does in fact reflect a pluralistic attempt to establish Jain belief. He thereby uses the method of falsification to solve a central question that is connected with epistemic pluralism. I put the question like this. How can it be established that a certain epistemic event is part of a wider, complete vision of an object investigated? In my paper today, I will spend most of my time for expounding this question. I will be presenting less textual evidence than I hope I will be able to, but I will sum up briefly my published interpretation of how Vidyanandan deals with the question. The proponents of a pluralistic epistemological model assume a variety of epistemic events for a single object. The components to be considered in this respect can be sketched as follow. First, on the ontological plane, there is something. Secondly, within the epistemological sphere, there is an epistemic event that reveals us an object. We see something, smell it, taste it, infer it, hear about it, etc. Due to this epistemic event, we are able to act with regard to the object, for instance, in the form of a speech act. The proponents of epistemic pluralism now assume that a multitude of epistemic events reveal one and the same object. Individual cognitive acts provide multiple, multiple epistemic access for a single object. Each and every one of these epistemic events highlights a particular aspect of the object and thereby provides adequate knowledge. A theoretical counterpart of epistemic pluralism is epistemic monism. Within this epistemological model, a single epistemic event only would be accepted for, for providing adequate knowledge. Divergences in the characterization of a single object would not imply a plurality in the epistemic sphere, but would have to be regarded as a matter of speech. The unique epistemic event carries the potential to be adaptable to various contexts. 
Against this loose connection between epistemic access and the acts based on it, representatives of epistemic pluralism can claim a very close connection. By the different point of views of various epistemic agents, the vision of one and the same object can be diversified to so large an extent that it would not make sense to presuppose a single valid cognition only. It seems rather reasonable to assume a variety of valid cognitions which are justified according to the particular standpoints from where an object is apprehended. In this respect, the parable of the blind and the elephant is sometimes referred to. The story is about a number of blind men who grasp different parts of an elephant and travel foolishly about the elephant's nature, proposing that it would be a pillar, a wall, a rope, etc. Within the context of epistemic pluralism, the blind men are to be interpreted as epistemic agents who have limited access to the thing as a whole. They grasp only parts and build a proposition on the limited epistemic access available to them. The topics that, sorry, this is the slide. The topos that limited epistemic access is the reason for divergent propositions about one and the same thing is also a distinctive feature of China thought. Hema Chandra in his Anya Yoga Vyavacheda Dvatrimshika puts it like this. Anyonya Paksha Pratipaksha Bhavat Yata Pare Matsarnach Pravadaha Nayan Asheshan Avishesham Ichchan Na Paksha Pati Samayasta Tate. In the way other statements that is, statements of other schools are hostile because they are confronting each other as position and counterposition. In that way, your tradition, that is, Jina Mahavira's tradition, does not fall to a position as it accepts all viewpoints without distinction. While other doctrines seek to establish their respective theories on a single view and therefore engage in conflict with each other, Jainism provides a worldview in which all views are considered and put into frame. Such a concept of Jaina pluralism fits to the interpretation of the parable of the blind and the elephant sketched above. On the ontological level, an object possessing innumerable, innumerable properties, anekadharma dharma kavastu, is assumed. According to the specific condition, conditions and intentions of the epistemic agents, the properties become manifest in viewpoints or perspectives, nyaya, which grasp only a single part of the object, ekadesha grahim. These individual, epistemic, these individual epistemic events diverge from each other according to different circumstances, circumstances but converge in the object. They are the basis for various acts, acts with respect to the object. Speech acts are to be considered correct if they are carried out in the awareness that only limited access is provided with the viewpoint. The adding of siat to a proposition would be highlighting this awareness. However, these components are not sufficient for a satisfactory description of the cognitive act. I hope to make this clear by turning back to the parable of, parable of the blind and the elephant. The epistemic events that lead to the false statements of the blind about the elephant's nature can be declared as highlighting parts of the whole under one condition only, namely if I know what they are talking about. If a form of knowledge is available that defines the object under investigation, completely partial knowledge can be identified as such. Only epistemic access to the thing as such allows for the identification of other epistemic access as being partial. If this complete vision is available as a cognitive criterion, one can, declare based, one can declare statements based on the partial epistemic events as being correct in a certain respect. This distinction between two different types of epistemic events is reflected in Jaina philosophy under the terms Pramana and Naya. Yashuvichaya's Jaina Thakka Basha puts it like this. Viewpoints are particular ascertainments that grasp only a single part of a thing without rejecting the other facets of it, that is, of the thing, which is completely defined by the means of knowledge. A graphical representation of this concept would, concept would like this. So we have the complete knowledge, would be the great triangle, and then there we have a partial focus inside this complete knowledge, which, is, which are the basis for speech act based on this particular which are the basis for the speech actors. 
The Naya more specifically, specifically would be a partial epistemic event compatible with the complete vision. Alternative ex epistemic access is not excluded. It is there, it's, 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 it lingers in the background, but, it is not, but it's not the focus now. And resulting from this Nyaya is, uh, is a correct statement about an aspect of the object. The dual Nyaya, however, would be the neglecting of other aspects. It is an epistemic event with dis which disregards the complete vision and neglects alternative epistemic access. What results is a one-sided one statement, one statement about the object. With Pamana Naya and Durnaya, the inventory for different types of epistemic access would be so far the following. We have Pamana, accurate and complete vision of an object under investigation. It's a valid cognition. Then we have the Naya, also valid. They are partial cognition, focusing on one aspect. Acceptance of alternative epistemic access is somehow implicit. And then we have Durnaya, neglection of alternative epistemic access, and this would be the only invalid cognition so far. This inventory of types is the one most prominently, prominently referred to in the pictures of China perspectivism. However, it is not complete with regard to invalid epistemic access. True, if one focuses on a certain aspect of an object, the neglection of other parts is an error. It is erroneous to say an elephant is a rope and nothing else. But what about statements based on epistemic events which are not dire directed at the object under investigation, neither as a whole nor as a part of it? What about the fools? I'm sorry. What about the fools or the willful statements like in our example, the thing you are talking about is very tiny, like a mouse? This would be a statement based on an epistemic event which is not directed at the object under investigation. Speech is elastic and we can attribute anything we want to an object under consideration. The question is, are our attributions adequate and how do we decide? How real, rationable, acceptable cognitions are to be distinguished from myths, fairy tales, figments of the imagination, untenable guessworks and irrational dogmas in short, how can objective knowledge and subjective prejudice, prejudice be told apart? Taking this into consideration, the inventory for different types of epistemic excess has to be supplemented as follows. There is first the complete vision of the object investigated, then there has partial, partial epistemic excess, including, ex ex including the acceptance of alternative epistemic access that would be valid, valid, and if it's a neglection of alternative epistemic access, it would be invalid. And then, of course, there's an epistemic event directed at another, no at another object and not the object investigated. Such an inventory may be nice, but how do we apply it in the process of gaining knowledge? How can the blind be enlightened on the elephant's true nature? In modern narrations of the parable, sometimes a passing sage tells the struggling blind man what it's all about. He shares his complete vision and makes them believe that their previous assumptions were based on limited epistemic excess. And they lived happily ever after. But how to make it plausible, preferentially, preferentially on rational grounds, that certain epistemic events are perspectives, that is, that they are consonant with each other and can be dissolved in a wider complete vision. In this regard, it is interesting to note how the presumable complete vision appears to those who are lacking it. It is nothing else than another epistemic event dissonant to the others. It may be richer in content, but still forms an unresolved alternative. I see two methods how an advocate of epistemic pluralism could make use of his epistemological model in the investigation of an object. Metaphorically speaking, the wise man or a person who, who believes in him has two options how to explain to the blind what they have at hand. The first method would be the attempt to show them that they are somehow right in their assumptions. The second method, that they are wrong. The first method consists in a collection of all the statements available and declare them to be based on alternative epistemic access for the object investigated. The sage could say, the entity we're talking about is indeed like a pillar, but that's not all. It's also a bit like what your colleague is saying, like a wall, like a rope. 
However, this method of identifying certain, epist certain epistemic access as partial and as consonant with others is rationally unsatisfying. It seems naive to believe that by gluing together certain epistemic events, an integrative cognitive criterion is accomplished. How should one know that the diverse epistemic events are referring to a single identity, single entity indeed, and that they do not in fact refer to separate entities? Without the clarification of whether it is leg legitimate to connect certain epistemic events as referring to one and the same thing, or whether they have rather to be stated separately as referring to different things, a discriminative criterion produced by a mere aggregation of components is a figment produced by historical <laughs> circumstance. The second method to put, epistemic plural, to put epistemic pluralism to use is the falsification of dissonant epistemic alternatives. To refer to the parable once more, the sage or his follower could start saying, you're assuming the invested entity is a pillar. Well, a pillar has such and such properties. They do not apply here. Therefore, it is not a pillar. This is the method Vidyananden is using, and I will finally illustrate it by the example how he examines the relation of jiva, jiva and cognition in the Satyashasana Pariksha. The object of investigation is the relation of soul and cognition. For the examination of this relation, he collects four alternative statements as a first step. The divergent positions are soul and cognition are completely different from each other, Savata Bina, or identical in a certain respect, Katanchit Abhina, or the relation is to be regarded as a complete identity, Savata Tadatmya, or as a particular difference. The next step consists of a confrontation of the two respective pairs of uh, contradictory epistemic events. In this pair here, one alternative is the position of the Vaisheshika, namely that soul and cognition are completely different from each other, Savata Bina. The other is the giant's position that they are somehow identical. These alternatives are mutual exclusive, dissonant to each other. It is not possible that both apply. What Vidyanandin now does um, appears to be most remarkable. He is not arguing in favor of the alternative proposed by his tradition. He is arguing against the other. This reflects a decisive stance in the question how adequate knowledge can be achieved. The stance is this. An epistemic situation where two mutually exclusive alternatives are given for one and the same object, for, for, for one and the same subject, subject matter investigated, may not be solvable with regards to their validity, as both could represent false knowledge. But it can be solved with regards to their invali invalidity, since at least one of them has necessarily to be false. If a falsification of one of, the two, one of two dissonant epistemic alternatives is successful, a handhold is received with the remaining epistemic event. If this residual epistemic event withstands even further attempts at falsification, it can be suspected that its content rep represents adequate knowledge of the subject matter investigated. With regard to the alternatives here, Vidyanandi thoroughly falsificates the position of the Vasheshika that soul and cognition are completely identical and draws the conclusion that the statement identical in a certain respect is based on a valid epistemic event. He applies the same method in the examination of the position of Advaita Vedanta that soul and cognition are completely identical, Savata Tadatmya, and concludes that particular difference, Katanchit Beda, is correct. By this procedure, the collected epistemic events can be gradually separated in two groups. A group of epistemic events which has been subjected to a successful falsification and another group of epistemic events which have not been, have not been disproved. Here now, the epistemic pluralist can proceed to step three by building up the hypothesis that the later group consists of epistemic events that equally provide valid epistemic access, and that by a complete vision of the subject matter investigated, all of them have to be taken into account. I come back to the question asked in the beginning of my paper, how can it be established that a certain epistemic event is part of a wider complete vision of an object investigated? 
With the Ardentins, the answer to this question would be, in my eyes, that we have to start with a confrontation of mutually exclusive epistemic events and the attempt to falsificate one of them. His refutation of the main tenets of doctrines opposed to Jainism is not a mere logical consequence of the ontological and epistemological theories of the Jainas, but an attempt to rationally establish it. Against the backdrop of a multitude of demonstrably invalid epistemic events, the respective opposed epistemic events can be regarded as valid. The, Jain, the Jainas' proposal and willingness to comprise the latter in a single unified and complete vision gains in strength and plausibility with every epistemic event that has been identified as false. The lesson for the blind man and for us is we are lucky if we find one who contradicts our statements. It could turn out that at least one of us is wrong. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.